stories of the pages of our history textbooks lack credibility, but out of them all, the story of Genghis Khan seems to be a crown jewel of all unbelievable fictions. Huge swarms of Mongolian warriors stormed into Europe, conquered everything, including Asia on the way, and reached all the way to Egypt. The History Channel documentaries assure us. But in the specialized literature for historians only, we read about a completely different story. So, in the specialized literature, they admit, well, of course, there wasn't. Uh, there were a couple of Mongolians in the army. The majority were Russian Tatars, but it is called the Mongolian army. Well, of course, how can you have huge black swarms of Mongolian warriors if you never had any swarms of any type of people in Mongolia ever? It is so scarcely populated. It's deserty. Even if we assume that they mobilized all their women, children and camels, still it could never account for those swarms shown on the History Channel documentaries. Just two centuries ago, its entire population was barely a half of a million people. According to mainstream sources, in Genghis Khan's time, Mongolia's population was a couple of thousand people, most of which, of course, were women and children. And by the way, the Mongolians are the most peaceful nation on earth you can imagine. They still lead nomadic lives, as they used to do centuries ago. And the idea that they could have mobilized an army, any reasonable army, out of these couple thousand people is quite disconnected from reality. Because the men are very few. And the ones that are around are needed to always assemble and disassemble their tents. Because they are a nomadic people, they constantly move, following their cattle. And they move their tents as well. In addition, in terms of natural resources, Mongolia is deprived of metals and doesn't have any record, or any tradition at all, in terms of the making of metal weaponry. That is why uh, that uh, story is presented in the professional uh, historians' uh, literature that uh, the army was of foreigners and there were just a couple of Mongolians on the top. And how did this couple of Mongolians convince the most mighty Chinese and Russian armies to become their subservients? Well, to that question the so-called historians just don't give any answers, skip it, and it is left to us to wonder how did they do it. Well, I came up only with two ideas. First of all, maybe the couple of Mongolians on the top took over the enemy's armies by scaring them with a procession of paper dragons. Another scenario that I would suggest for inclusion in those uh, mainstream history books is that the traditional Mongolian fighters, like the ones you see on the photo, they organized a rainbow parade for the Russian and Chinese armies, and when the other side saw them, they decided, we are your slaves forever. Maybe you didn't find my two suggestions very convincing. But my endeavor was to maintain the general level of credibility of the rest of the stories that they're giving us. Like, for example, the Mongolian fighters, why they could conquer two or three continents, is that they could appear out of nowhere and disappear, evaporate. Magonia, 
So are they telling us that he had some sort of uh, shamans in his army that were making people visible, invisible or something like that? Indeed, there were and still there are martial arts in those parts of Asia that would uh, seem truly magical to us. But that was spread all over the region, not just in Mongolia. And indeed, uh, now, these uh, martial arts are present in a uh, higher, more developed uh, levels exactly in the areas that were supposedly conquered by uh, Genghis Khan, not Mongolia. And there is zero evidence suggesting that it was any different in those times. cartographer Abraham Ortelius is showing us what people meant when they said Mongols and Mongols in the past. They were people part of Tartaria and they are clearly depicted as being blonde. They lived in Siberia. Let's have a look at the actual historic sources. Maybe they will give us a clue who invaded Europe and Asia and how did they do it? This full story of uh, some Mongolians taking over uh, two, three continents, reaching even Africa, started to appear on the pages of the history books sometime in the 18th century. Before that, the historians didn't know anything about it. And this is how the story emerged. In year 1826, the Russian Academy of Sciences, which, by the way, is a foreign entity, offered a very substantial financial grant for any local or foreign historian who would uh, compile a story of Mongolian invasion of Russia and Europe. That's how the idea appeared for the first time. They had a strict requirement that the works must be submitted within three years. Interestingly enough, six years later, they came up with the very same offer again. Well, they did have a single response, a work submitted uh, from Germany, but it was not approved. And uh, by the way, till date, uh, specialists in Oriental studies say that although many have uh, tried to really delve deep into the matter, till date, uh, there is not a single comprehensive published re research on this so-called invasion in either scientific or even in the form of popular literature. And still, it is accepted as history by the Academia. Usually they would uh, quote two authentic sources. One of them is an 18th century book called The Secret History of the Mongols. Even prominent uh, mainstream Oriental historians doubt the validity of this source and full reference uh, can be found in the new chronology books of Anatoly Fomenko to which I have uh, provided links already many times. And the second source quoted as pure and authentic is the work of the Arabic uh, historian Rashid ad Din of course, a copy of the Golden Book miraculously emerged in St. Peter's book exactly when needed for compiling this uh, new history. But of course, the validity of every historic uh, document uh, can be questioned. But what is the most uh, disturbing here is that uh, the first translator Berezin openly admits that he was pressured and forced to insert names and uh, geographical coordinates in his translation according to his knowledge. What does it mean according to his knowledge? The translator explains 
In many occasions, the diacritic marks were missing. Those are the pronunciation marks of how the names are pronounced. And in many cases, yet the very names were missing altogether. And the translator was forced to add them according to his knowledge. What does it mean according to his knowledge if the book he is translating is actually the only alleged source of any knowledge on this matter to start with? So if this entire story of the Mongolian invasion of Europe and Asia was basically a sponsored idea which emerged a couple of hundred years ago, then what did people believe in before that? Do we have any contemporary records of some sort of invasion of that time? For example, a certain person called Julian, a Hungarian missionary and witness of this invasion, describes the invaders as Tartars that were a blonde, Gothic people. They came from Gothia, Tartaria. Now, this could be confusing for those who haven't read yet the books of the New Chronology by Anatoly Fomenko, where numerous quotes are given proving that in older times, when people say Goths, they actually meant the Slavic people. And the modern idea that these are just people of Germanic origin doesn't quite do the Goth idea justice. This division was artificially created at a time when the nations that mixed with the survivors and were spreading their survivor culture their true history, needed to be blurred. And that is why, at different locations, they were given different names. And, nowadays, people think that these were altogether different people, while reality was different. People who have a Gothic heritage in modern terms may have the feeling that I want to rob them of their glorious history by saying that the Goths were actually Slavic people. If that's the case, you may turn it the other way around and take it to mean that the Slavic people were Goths, if that sounds better. Here, on the old map, the truth transpires. Gothia is in Tartaria. Slavic and Gothic people were one and the same. Actually, it's a couple of places that are called Gothia on this very same map. And all of them are on the shore of the Black Sea. One is um, on the north. Uh, west uh, shore and uh, the other one is straight forward north from uh, the Black Sea. Nowadays the people of those areas are called Slavic, they are not called Goths. And all this confusion with the names was created only on purpose to blur the truth about the true origin of the various nations. But regardless what name we put on the invaders, one thing is for sure, all the contemporary writers, without exception, describe them as Caucasian people, very often blonde. Which again is not disputed by the specialized uh, mainstream historic literature, they just add that thing, yes, the army was Caucasian, but the chief was Mongolian. These are some contemporary drawings, art, illustrating what people meant in those days when they say Tartars. Here visitors from Western Europe depict what they saw when they visited the court of the Tartar prince and princess. And this is how medieval people believed Genghis Khan looks before the introduction of the new fabricated history.
Marco Polo visited the direct descendants, the sons of uh, Genghis Khan, and this is an illustration made by his contemporaries upon his return after he published his accounts of what he saw. Here Marco Polo is being welcomed by the great Mongol, the Tartar king. But when they print this same book in modern times, this is the type of illustrations that they put. This depicts the very same scene. Another modern illustration, the Great Khan, looks completely different from what Marco Polo speaks about in his book. This is how it looked in the original illustrations. <laughs> Now, this is an old uh, drawing of another Mongol, Mongol ruler. Very interesting how he looks uh, when Western European uh, artists paint him. Now, that's what you see on the right side. What did it mean, actually, Tartars at the time, medieval times, when contemporaries were describing the invaders as Tatars or Tartars? Nowadays, a very small and relatively unimportant province of Russia is uh, called Tatarstan, but as we saw in the previous episode, in the past, the full um, region, even much bigger than Russia, even including parts of Eastern Europe, was called Tartaria. This was uh, the name um, by which the country was known in the Western circles. The people that lived there themselves would identify themselves in a different fashion. The residents of uh, what we call nowadays Mongolia were definitely some of the Tartars because they were always part of Great Tartaria. But uh, they were not uh, particularly influential, uh, that's why they are uh, very rarely mentioned on any medieval maps. And indeed, because we see Mongols all over the place in Tartaria, uh, usually it is somewhere else and not the, the Mongols' word is somewhere else in uh, the area by influenced by the survivors and not uh, where Mongolia is nowadays. In this particular map, a Mongol is uh, placed in Siberia and not in Mongolia. Let's not forget what uh, the medieval texts tell us. Uh, the Tartars were gods. For example, on uh, this uh, old uh, map we see Tartars all over in Eastern Europe, in what it is nowadays uh, Bulgaria, Romania, all these uh, countries. Even as close as a couple of centuries ago, these Slavic nations were still part of this bigger federation which was still honoring the principles of the culture of the nature people, the survivors, or the scattered people, as Mavro Orbini called them. Now, some of you may object, but all these... Uh, Eastern European countries, they had their own kings at that time and there are documents about it, isn't it? That is partially true. But when the team of the new chronology examined the actual dynasties of all these uh, Slavic uh, kings, ancient Bulgarians, uh, Dacians, and so on, 
transpires that these uh, dynasties, in many cases, not all, sometimes there were local rulers as, as well, especially in uh, more recent times, they are uh, duplicates of the Khans that were uh, the Khans of Tartaria, that the huge federation that was honoring the rules of the survivors and their culture. What does it mean that they were recognized as uh, phantom duplicates? Well, charts are made with uh, the names of all kings and other details are included like the uh, duration of their rule, also main events that happened, personal details about uh, their families and wives and so on. And that is done for both sets of dynasties. And this is a sample of how the resulting uh, charts look like. And when we notice that full dynasties, the, the names of the kings, the years of their reign, their achievements, the actual wars, when we see that they match very, very closely, it is uh, really a very good uh, chance that this is, we have a case of uh, actual phantom uh, dynasty. And the, the f need of such a phantom dynasties arose when this federation of Great Tartaria was removed from history. Then they had to fill up the gaps with something. And because it would have been harder to convince people that it was uh, crocodiles from the constellation of Andromeda that were uh, ruling the earth at that time, they had to make some sort of uh, mixture of semi-truth and fiction that would be believable to people. And that's how these phantom dynasties appeared. That was much easier because anyway the names were pronounced differently in all uh, countries, the name of a very same person. So uh, the main trick was that oh, th these were different kings, this was your local king, it wasn't uh, the head of the federation, while actually in the history records it would be something uh, else, but that's how they twisted it. For example, the Lithuanian and Polish Tartars, they took part in the army of Napoleon, and that's why some artifacts from them were saved. This was their hat, and this was their symbol. It looks somewhat Muslim, but in reality, as we know from earlier episodes, the crescent sign was one of the symbols of this vast federation of nations that supported the survivor's culture. In many cases, if one visited the traditional Orthodox churches in Eastern Europe and listens when the priests read from the old texts, he or she will hear something like Boga Nasheva, which means our Lord which is a simple and straightforward Russian language. The time when all Slavic people belonged to a single federation was not at all far away in the past, but it looks like this because all the common elements of their culture, although they are absolutely the same, bear different names in each country, according to mainstream history. Hi. 
Genghis Khan, who conquered a couple of continents and created the biggest empire ever, as mainstream history assures us, was a Mongol himself. What does that mean? Did he come from nowadays Mongolia? Actually, Mongolia acquired the status of an independent country for the first time in the 20th century. Earlier, cartographers did not feel the need to mention Mongols, any Mongols where nowadays Mongolia is, they would usually place them in two places in Siberia, this map being just one example out of the countless. Two places with Mongols in Siberia and none in current Mongolia. Only uh, at the later stages in 17th and 19th century we start seeing some sort of Mughalia or Mughalia on the maps, which uh, later on evolved into Mongolia. So the people of nowadays M Mongolia are just one out of the many descendants of nations that called themselves Mongols. For example, this map is from the times when nowadays Mongolia was just emerging as a separate entity. That's why we see both Mughalia and Mongols on the same map, the Great Mongol Empire as well. Countless old uh, drawings and paintings depict the Mongols as uh, clearly Caucasian people with uh, turbans on their heads. For example, this is what the ambassador in Moscow from Western Europe uh, saw on his uh, reception upon arrival in Russia. These are the contemporary old illustrations of this book. And just a remark for those of you who like to read uh, the Bible, some of the areas, because there are four or five general areas on the old maps that uh, appear with name uh, Mongol, uh, two of them are in Siberia and one of them gradually transforms into the kingdom of uh, Gog and Magog. And here, some uh, old Bible original uh, text, it says with uh, Cyrillic letters, this is not a translation, Magog Knyaza Roska. So it turns out that the allegedly mystical kingdom, biblical kingdom of uh, Gog and Magog is nothing else but uh, the Siberian parts of the Knyaza Roska, the kingdom of the Rasayanami, Roska comes from Rasayanami, the scattered people, as Mavro Orbini called them. So again, this very common trick has been used, a necessary mystification. Oh, nobody knows where is Gog and Magog, it's biblical, it's lost. No, it's not. They are telling us that the location is unknown just because they don't want us to hear about the great Tartaria, which is the great empire of the Mughals. And by the way, those uh, Mongols that had invaded, uh, took over Europe and Asia, were the same uh, people that we call Mongols or Mongols nowadays. They were not Mongolians. The Mongolians were a small and not very significant part of the Mughal culture. They were not all the Mughals or Mughals. And actually, honestly, looking at the, the older maps, there are many Mongol places, but usually India is the one that comes with the biggest letters and it's the most frequent one, it says, with the big letters. Magna Mongol, uh, the great empire of the Mongols. 
Although various alternative uh, forms are used nowadays, like uh, Mughal, even Mughal in its pure form is uh, still used till date. It doesn't mean that the Indians are Mongolians, though. Actually, th till date, Mughal means a rich, influential person, any person of any race, th not necessarily Mongolian. This is, for example, how the uh, Mongol warriors would uh, look like, and this is what the modern so-called historians are trying to convince us that they looked like, and this is a so-called restoration of an old painting. Very professionally they restored it, indeed. And it is not by chance that India is a favorite for those who seek genuine spirituality. It is there uh, where the people manage to organize themselves and write down the Vedic literature which contains direct instructions from the old civilizations with little, relatively little editing. And because through the ages they remained again only relatively loyal to the angelic principles on which the Vedic books are based. And by the way, speaking of India, the famous Taj Mahal is, a, is an excellent example, an evidence of the times when Islam and the Hindu faith, so to say, were one and the same. Usually Taj Mahal is considered a Muslim building. And yet, below the layers of restoration, at many places, Hindu symbols and elements surface. And because most people in India are brainwashed with the new fraudulent history, what is the result of these findings of uh, both uh, Hindu and Muslim layers in Taj Mahal? The result is that it uh, further fires this uh, religious intolerance. People quarrel, oh, it's ours, no, it's ours. They fight, they kill each other because of that. And not only uh, Islam and Hinduism are branches growing from the same trunk, with, from the tree with the same root. This is applicable to all religions. They, they started branching out when Spirituality became so blurred that the need of organized religion arose. Christianity is yet another branch of that very same tree. Look at this uh, old image of uh, Kremlin. The style of uh, dressing and the interior is purely Mughal, Mongol, Mughal, whatever you want to call it. And not only all men were wearing the same turbans on their heads, pay attention to what the Indian mademoiselles wear on their heads. They wear crowns of style that is identical to that of the Tartaria princesses. The Indians kept carefully for us not only the literature of the survivors, but also their outfits. This is what the ladies wear in India on the street even nowadays. These are Indian fashion shows and these are fashion shows from the West where the advanced people live.
So the penguins assure us that not only Genghis Khan conquered half of the world, but his dynasty ruled over the majority of the conquered territories for entire 300 years. That York only ended, continue the historians, in 15th century. Sounds like a grand empire to me. Has it left any artifacts or writings of some sort? Well, not really, no artifacts, but the penguins, sorry, historians, have come up with uh, writings. And indeed, they have found one stone that appears to have a Mongolian signs on it. They also uh, say that the Persian novel is actually Mongolian. It was never studied before as Mongolian because it looks Persian and they, they themselves continue. It is actually in Tartar language, they say, but the signs must be Mongolian. Well, how convincing. Two other pieces of writing have suddenly emerged in uh, European private libraries. And if we believe a translator called Schmidt, they must be Mongolian, although uh, the writing of the two documents um, uh, differs, and it differs from the stone as well. And in addition, they have been found under suspicious circumstances. But if Schmidt says, then we can build the world history upon his honest word. The image, by the way, again we have Marco Polo visiting the great Mongolian Khan. To make it look uh, Mongolian, the so-called historians, uh, they just can't, uh, are ready to tell anything. Like, these scripts were not studied before, because if you look at them, they look like a Turkish. And also the descendants of the uh, Mongols, according to, according to that uh, novel that, that they are talking about, are actually Turkish people. Very strange that the Turks are not aware that they are actually Mongolians. My cat suffers from the same problem. He thinks he's actually a lion. But luckily we have uh, historians in penguin suits who are here to tell us who are we. And so we cannot make mistakes like the cat or like the Turks, who actually think they are Turks, but they are actually Mongolians. So those few signs uh, on the stone and uh, the other writings that uh, we must believe are Mongolian somehow, though they don't match, is all we have left of this empire that ruled for hundreds of years. Strange. Do you remember the Arabic Chronicle? where the translator was forced to add names and locations according to his knowledge? Well, that is very often quoted by mainstream historians. But strange that they only quote some parts of it, the ones that were maybe later on added. And they don't like to quote other parts. For example, the ones that describe the appearance of Genghis Khan as a blonde man with blue eyes. Other historic records describe his sons in the same way. Well, the old images are not included in the history books, they say. And this is how the new Genghis Khan looks like. But if indeed the Mongolian army was plundering for hundreds of years vast territories of the world, it must have had some artifacts from all the plundering, or some sort of capital, or any sophisticated culture? Anything at all? No, it's just zero. It's not there. I mean, the Mongolians are very simple shepherds. And in recent years, when more and more of them became literate, to their great surprise, they learned from the Westerners that they had been ruling the world at one point. They had no clue about it before that. Yeah, all those monuments of Genghis Khan in Mongolia were erected after they heard about it from the West, about their history. They don't have any legend stating that they have ever ruled anything, actually. Yes, they did have great Khans, but those were the Khans of Tartaria that they were always a part of. As far as any of the Mongolian tribes ruling continents, that is just non-existent in their history or traditions.
task of every good uh, mainstream historian is just copy and paste. But there are exceptions and Eric Middleford is one of them. He used to work in various European historical archives and actually he started reading the old books. He noticed very strange ideas spreading amongst the nobles and clergy of Europe in the 16th century. He found uh, numerous unrelated records that in, in various parts of Europe men of high position were trembling with fear and suffering from severe paranoia that tomorrow the Tatars and Mongols are invading again. How is that possible? If those were really from Mongolia and some century before that they already uh, lost their uh, strength and were no longer holding Asia, how could they arrive in Europe tomorrow by flight or? Middleford really found out a lot of uh, genuine uh, records of otherwise absolutely sane uh, people suffering from this very strange paranoia. Even to the point that uh, uh, one, for example, was uh, sleeping with uh, full body military armor at night out of fear that the Mongols may knock on his window. Middleford decided that, that they must have uh, suffered from some extremely weird mental disease and these uh, ideas were even contagious and uh, also infecting only noble people and clergy. Well, his hypothesis is it, not less uh, weird uh, than the virus that infected the nobles, but in the light of uh, the new chronology history, all this uh, fits uh, perfectly very well, because in the uh, 16th uh, century, still the Tartars and Mongols were there where they have always been in Tartaria. It's absolutely possible that there were rumors at that time that the Tartars were planning to conquer Europe again. Please note that I am narrating these historical events not because I approve them or I endorse the very idea of some big empire, just on the contrary. The full point of the Survivor series is to point out how normal people were gradually tricked into empires, countries and other limitations just to lose their freedom. Once we become aware in what kind of trap have we fallen, then we'll know how to get out of it. <laughs> how the modern fairy tale myth about uh, Genghis Khan of Mongolia is perpetuated in the modern society with the help of mass media. Spicy articles assure us that scientists have found out that half percent of the full population of Earth now are descendants of Genghis Khan and colorful diagrams are added that nobody understands so that it makes it look scientific. 
it is soon even turned uh, into some sort of uh, business and show and you can even spend money to test yourself if you're descendant of Genghis Khan. Here and there a few voices uh, calling for sanity uh, are writing articles that this is impossible but when the monster big uh, media, the mass media supports it with uh, uh, spicy uh, titles we all with all to the super stood Genghis Khan, people believe that's real science. Some people still can think for themselves and when they read this they did the math of how many children he must have made and so on and still it it's impossible. He wouldn't have had time to do all this uh, 24 hour procreational job when did he sleep? When did he eat or go to war? And those who started the misinformation campaign at the first place thought about this and that's why they cleverly said, well, he didn't do it all by himself. It was his sons who did most of the hard work. It's not that his numerous sons did most of the work, so to say, because if they were born to raped women, they would be bastards, meaning the parents don't live together. And that means that they would have automatically less chances of having lots of progeny in the society where they live. They will have unequal chances for having children. Only his legitimate sons, uh, who will be negligibly small number, compared to percentages of the world's population, only they will have the opportunity to have more children than average. And actually, as these uh, spicy articles in the newspapers admit themselves somewhere towards the end with small letters, all this is based on a hypothesis and interpretation by certain scientists, not all of them agree, that a certain group may be, has this particular given pattern in their DNA code, because they had a common man in their ancestry. Even that is not sure. And even if we assume that all these people who belong to this group indeed had a common forefather a long time ago, hundreds of years ago, how would we know it's exactly Genghis Khan? They have never even found his capital, what to speak of mummy, or anything else, but they know that all the children are from him only. All this is uh, very depictive of how the newspaper articles, and especially their uh, titles with big letters, can uh, really create uh, very wrong impressions in people about their true history. In this case, all this uh, full story of Genghis Khan seems to be reinforced and confirmed by the uh, DNA study, while in reality, uh, the DNA uh, st <laughs> so-called study is actually based on this fiction. The story is also very depictive of how the so-called DNA science can easily be uh, become one of the uh, strong pillars of what I call the TV religion, means believe everything that TV tells you, for the simple reason that uh, they can just tell any nonsense and then say, oh, it is a result of scientific research, and they are not obliged to provide the uh, base data of this research, or even if they have to, it's so easy to manufacture, just take a computer and type any string of anything you want. And for those of you who still may doubt that uh, Genghis Khan has anything to do with Mongolia specifically, um, 
they may wonder, well, but he's mentioned in so many foreign chronicles. We see quotes of, uh, on the internet, you will find this is a, a depiction of Genghis Khan in Japanese chronicle, in uh, mm, Chinese chronicle. What about those? Well, Genghis Khan is not a proper personal name. It means the great Khan. So this makes it uh, very convenient to match any Khan, Khan, any ruler you wish to him. It is so easy because most rulers are described, at least in one place, as great. Actually, if you decide uh, to spend some uh, time uh, in a serious uh, study, you will find out that uh, the mainstream historians even have no clue what was the name of Genghis Khan in Mongolian at the time he was uh, supposedly ruling it. It is uh, that much a lack of... Uh, any information about him in Mongolia itself. The way they give it written and pronounced in Mongolian language, that is in modern Mongolian language, uh, at his time, in his epoch, completely different language was used, as they themselves admit, and they have no clue. Uh, I mean, they have different versions, but it is not even clear what was... Uh, his uh, name at that time. that I'm trying to deprive the poor Mongolians of their national pride. But if Genghis Khan was indeed, as he is portrayed by the mainstream sources, plunderer, aggressive invader, then should anybody of real noble nature be proud to have a man of such quality in his ancestry? But since the mainstream history is one big joke, we don't even know what kind of qualities he had and was he really an invader or was he just reclaiming lands which anyway originally belonged to Tartaria but that's a completely different subject. We are just in the dawn of discovering that Tartaria existed. We don't know much details of its history and wars. But the Mongolians indeed have something which they can be really proud of and that is that they are one of the most peaceful nations on earth they did not buy into parasitic propaganda for going to wars participating in wars and also they managed to preserve this amazing traditional music the mongolian throat singing which is like a time capsule from the times when those who survived from the old advanced civilizations were educating the simple tribal people of the earth. Yes, indeed, the Mongolians do have good reason to be very proud of their heritage. <laughs> <laughs> 